I want to begin uh, by welcoming all of you that are watching uh, via our broadcast today, uh, especially those of you at the Lee Summit, Blue Valley, and Olathe campuses. And uh, I'm gonna, I, normally I'd tell you to open your Bibles, but we're going to be using a whole bunch of different texts. And so if you're really, really quick, you can, you can keep up with us, but all the scripture is going to be on the screen. But I do think that this is going to be one of those messages where you're going to be uh, wanting to take some notes. So I would encourage you to do that. Today we begin a, a brand new year with a brand new sermon series, which we've entitled Reasons. First Peter chapter 3, verse 15 says, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. The word answer there is the Greek word apologia. It, it, it describes a speech of defense. And you should picture a defense attorney making a case for his client before a judge and a jury. That's what a apologia is. From this word, we get our word apologetics, which is all about making large logical arguments for the things that we believe. In the middle of the word apologia, at the root of it, there's the word logos for the word, and we get our word logic from that word. And so what Peter does here is he calls all of us who have placed our trust in Christ to spend some time preparing ourselves to give a logical defense or to be able to give the reasons that we have hope in Christ. And the goal of this study is to uh, help all of us do that better in 2018. Now, if you're one here that has not yet made up your mind about who Jesus is, about the Bible, about the church, I want you to know that we're really glad you're here. I'm going to be preaching mostly to Christians today, but we're glad you're here to, to listen in on this family business. And I want to challenge you, uh, if that's you, to, to try your best to listen maybe with an open heart and an open mind. Jesus said, if you will seek, you shall find. And so I, I would even encourage you to pray to him today. And you say, well, I don't even know that I believe he's listening. It doesn't matter if you believe he's listening. He's listening, right? So just, just ask him. Say, Lord, would, would you speak to me? If you're there, would you speak to me uh, through this study and through this series today? We need to all try to be seekers, right? And not scoffers, not skeptics. And so that's my challenge. Before we begin, it's essential that we address two different points, they're introductory points. Uh, one is, uh, they're both for this sermon, but they're also for this whole series. There's two things we gotta kinda understand. I kind of assume everybody knows them, but I, I said, well, you know, we need to stop and make sure that, that these are nailed down. The first one is one that there's a whole lot of misconceptions about. You hear conversations all the time. People say things, well, you can't prove that, or I can prove that, and, and they're all confused about what proof is, and they get things mixed up. The first point is that it's, it's very essential that we all understand the difference <clears throat> between historical and legal evidence and scientific evidence. They're both evidence, they're both important, but they're different things. The very word belief or faith implies that <clears throat> something cannot be empirically or scientifically proven. That doesn't mean because you can't prove something scientifically that you can't build a factual, logical, and plausible case for something. Scientific proof is based on being able to go into a laboratory or being in a situation where you can control different factors and isolate different factors. And the main point is that you demonstrate something is a fact by repeating that thing in the presence of someone who is questioning the fact. Now, this is a great thing, and it's how we've made a lot of uh, scientific advancement that's helped people and helped our society. But science and the scientific process is woefully inadequate for proving a whole lot of stuff, especially anything that relates to history. Science is, it, you can't prove things that are historical. You can't prove things about people and events because you can't go replicate those things. It is impossible for you to scientifically prove to anyone that you are in church today. You just can't do that scientifically. Proof about people and about events requires historical legal proof, which is not repeating something in a, the presence of a questioner, but it is demonstrating that something is factual beyond reasonable doubt, and here's the key word, by the weight of the evidence. You put the evidence together, it's beyond a reasonable doubt, and we... That's what we use as a proof. Now, there's three types of historical legal evidence. There's oral testimony. Someone tells you what they saw, heard, felt, experienced. 
There's written testimony. <clears throat> They're not here to, to actually be interviewed by us, but they've written down for us a testimony, a witness. And then there are exhibits and artif or artifacts. And in some cases, you know, you watch the TV shows, right? It's blood, a gun, a bullet, an inscription, a fingerprint, a picture, or, or a notebook. Using historical legal method, you probably could prove beyond a reasonable doubt that you attended church today, right? You probably could. How could you do that? Well, you could get some people that saw you to give a testimony. You could get witnesses to give a testimony. Maybe you could produce some artifacts. If you're taking notes, you could say, look, I was here. Here's the bulletin they handed out, and I filled it in. That's evidence that I was here. It doesn't prove it, because there's other ways to get that information, but, but it would be evidence. Maybe you add to that, that that maybe the guys, the tech crew, caught you on video, especially if you're here at the Overland Park campus. If you come in late to church and walk down the center aisle, part of you is on video. <laughs> it may not be the part you want everyone to see, but you're on video, right? But you know that you say that video, well, that would prove it conclusively. No, that's the weakest of the evidence. Video's the weakest evidence. Because trust me, those guys downstairs can make you appear to be places doing things and saying things that you weren't, <laughs> right? Trust me, I know that. So you have to prove that it's there, and then you have to prove that it's not been edited, right? And so it gets, it gets complicated. Listen, we can't prove historical things. You can't prove George Washington lived scientifically, but you can legally with legal and historical evidence. I cannot prove empirically that Jesus was born in a manger, died in a cross, rose again, much less that he is the son of God. But with historical legal evidence, I believe I can prove all of those things, and I can prove them beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, I, I'm going to begin there's another assumption that I'm making, and I'm, I'm just gonna ask you to concede this point. You should concede it, it shouldn't be a problem. I know that some of you are stubborn, you won't concede any points, so we're gonna deal with you next month, right? But, but for today's sermon, we are assuming the historicity of the Gospels. The historicity of the Gospels. Now that's a big word, but it's an important word. In a few weeks, I'm going to come back and I'm going to share why I believe the Bible is God's inspired, authoritative word. But today, I'm just ex asking you not to believe that. I'm asking you just to accept the historicity of the Gospels, just the first four books of the New Testament. And I'm not asking you to believe everything about them. Assuming historicity just means that we're going to treat them fairly, we're gonna treat the first four books in the New Testament just like we would any other piece of ancient literature. Now the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there's four short biographical accounts of the life and ministry of Jesus, and each bears the name of the author. Those authors, what they all have in common is they claim to be eyewitnesses to the life of Christ, or in the case of Luke, not to be an eyewitness, but to be one that actually interviewed many eyewitnesses. And so he claims that his testimony is a collection of many eyewitnesses. To assume the historicity of the Gospels, you don't have to believe everything they say about Jesus. You don't have to believe that Jesus walked on the water, but you do need to affirm that the Gospel writers apparently did believe that, or else maybe they had some secret agenda and for claiming that they saw it, but, but they wrote it. They were contemporaries who wrote it. I'm not asking you to believe today as I believe that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were inspired by the Holy Spirit to write their stories. I'm just asking you to accept that these four accounts were written by real men in real place or real time, and historians can take their documents and we can evaluate them with the same skepticism and critical eye that we do every other writing from antiquity. So with that said, with those two assumptions at our foundation, here are six reasons that I believe in Jesus. Six reasons that I believe in Jesus. Number one is the fact that there was a real man named Jesus. I don't believe about him, I believe in him, but I have to believe that he existed before I can put my trust in him. Why do I believe that? Well, first of all, the, the evidence is overwhelming. If, if you want, I, it's funny, I, I read this last night I, I saw this article last night, and someone uh, sent it to me, and I looked it up, and uh, this December 2017, National Geographic, the headlines are about the historical Jesus, 
And, and I really disagree with a whole bunch of stuff that the people said in the article, but one of the things they make is that nobody questions, no reasonable educated person questions the historical Jesus, that there was a man named Jesus. And the fact that we have over 24,000 handmade copies, an, an unbelievable, unprecedented number of New Testament manuscripts, which many of them, 6,000 of them are Greek copies of the Gospels. This is an unbelievable thing. You have these four stories and all these copies of these four stories, and the stories are unique and different, but they're internally consistent. That's amazing. And it proves that 2,000 years ago, Jesus was a man who was born into a devout Jewish family in Roman-occupied Palestine. It doesn't prove who he is or what he did. It just proves that he was here. There was a guy here named Jesus. Number two, I believe that Jesus claimed, uh, actually, I don't believe this. I'm telling you why I believe. This is a fact. This is a fact, an arguable fact. This Jesus that lived claimed an absolute unique oneness with the one creator God of the Hebrew scripture. Now, <clears throat> as I said, no reasonable educated person questions the historicity of Jesus, that there was a real man who once lived named Jesus. But for some strange reason, there's all signs of cults and there's all kinds of really, really smart educated people that will try to argue with you that Jesus never actually claimed any, to be anything special, that he never claimed to be divine. He never claimed to be God. Now, I'm going to overwhelm you with evidence that proves beyond any shadow of a doubt that that is the stupidest thing that anyone's ever said. It's a ludicrous claim. And when someone says that, it's like, it's like trying to argue that two plus two doesn't equal four. It's just, it, you, I can't believe you're really saying that. And so here's what I'm gonna share with you. When I hear very intelligent people and educated people that I know to be intelligent say that Jesus never claimed to be God or divine or different, I, I can't help but suspect, because it's such a ridiculous thing to say, that they have some ulterior motive. That's what I believe. And uh, I, I can't, I'm not a mind reader, so I don't know exactly what it is, but my suspicion is when people say stuff like that, they are looking for a way to escape all the implications of his life and ministry and the claims he made. Because if Jesus is who he says he is and did what he said he did, then there's implications of that. And so rather than we deal with those, they'll just kind of deny the obvious, but that's what I believe. Now everything that we understand about Jesus, everything you hear about Jesus and read about Jesus, it must be viewed through the lens and the filter of the first century Jewish context in which he lived in which these things were written. If someone says to you, well, yes, Jesus said he was God's son, but we're all God's children, so that's not a claim to be anything special. That's not a claim to be deity. That's a person that's totally ignorant of the biblical context, or else they know the biblical context, and they're a heretic, right? They're, they're intentionally deceiving. Now, you don't have to be a Greek scholar to see this in the context. Just a little bit of attention to how the people in that day understood what is being said, instead of reading our view, our use of the words on it, just try to understand how they said it. Just a little bit of attention, and you will see this clearly. You will see when Jesus used the term Son of God, what he meant by it, and how those people understood it. Let me show you. For example, Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1 is the last book. Revelation is the last book written in the New Testament, written in 90 AD. Jesus died 33 AD. He's written in 90, 91, 92, right in there, late 90s, early 90s. And it was written specifically, distributed among the churches of Asia Minor, so that they would be reading it out loud to the church. Now, this is a persecuted church. So imagine you're a first century Christian and we've gathered together and we have to be very careful because if people find out that we're gathering together, it, we could all die. Our families could all die. And we have this letter from the Apostle John who we know was one of Jesus' disciples and he had a vision of Jesus and, and he's gonna, we're gonna read it out loud what John wrote. How do you think those Christians, what do you think they understood Jesus to be claiming about himself when he said this? I am the first and last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever. 
You think they said, well, he's just claiming to be a good man? That's not what that says, and that's not how they would have understood it. Or think about the very familiar Matthew chapter 16, when Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Friends, Peter was not saying to Jesus in that moment, well, Jesus, you're a child of God just like the rest of us. That's not what he was saying. No, Peter was saying, you are the Christ. You are the anointed one. You are the promised one. The one for whom we've been waiting, the prophesied one. The one who's come to redeem Israel. You are the only begotten, the only holy son of the living God. That's what Peter was saying. It's very different. And you can't read that scripture and not understand it in the context. In John chapter five, the Jews were all upset because Jesus had broken one of their laws about the law, healed on the Sabbath, and and when they confronted him, he referred to himself as God's son, and this just set them off. He said, hey, I'm only doing my father's work. Well, how did they understand what he was saying? How did they respond to that? Look at verse 18. For this reason, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but also calling God his own father. Listen, here's how they understood it. Making himself equal with God. No one ever got upset with Jesus for saying, let the little children come unto me or love your neighbor. That's not what got him crucified. It was this stuff, I am equal with God. I am one with God. I am God in the flesh. That was the claim that set off these Jews. Over in John chapter 10, verse 24, it says, the Jews then gathered around him and were saying to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered them, I told you and you did not believe. The works I do in my Father's name, these testify of me, but you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. And listen, listen to this outstanding, this outlandish claim. I, not my Father, not God in heaven, I, Jesus said, I give eternal life to them. And they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. What a bold claim for a preacher, a teacher, a man to make that he himself could give his followers eternal life? Jesus continued, my father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them from the father's hand and I and the father are one. Now how how did they respond? Watch this. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. And Jesus answered them, I showed you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you stoning me? And they answered him, for a good work we are not stoning you, but for blasphemy. Because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. Friends, people today don't understand what Jesus claimed. People back then understood what Jesus claimed. It was very clear. There was another title that Jesus received that got him into more trouble He used it of himself. It got him into more trouble than the title Son of God. He said in uh, John chapter 8, 56, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it, and he was glad. And so the Jews said to him, you're not even 50 years old. How have you seen Abraham? And Jesus said, truly I say to you, before Abraham was born, listen, he didn't say I was. What did he say? I am Really, Jesus? You're gonna use that word? You're gonna use and refer by yourself by the unmentionable name of God, the one that God first revealed to Moses that those Jews wouldn't even write out fully? They substituted words when they said it out loud. They wouldn't say it, and Jesus said it. I am. Look at their reaction. They understood. Therefore, they picked up stones to stone him. In Mark 14, He was being tried before the Sanhedrin and the high priest Caiaphas said, are you the Christ? Are you the son of the blessed one? And again, Jesus said, I am. And that set him off. Of course, then he piled on, he he poured salt in the wound. He says, and when you see, when you see the son of man, referring to himself, sitting at the right hand of the mighty one and coming on the clouds. Listen, a biblically illiterate person might miss this point 
But Caiaphas, the high priest, this expert in the law, he did not miss the point. No, no one in that council missed the point. They knew that when he was saying, I'm the son of man sitting at the right hand of God coming on the clouds, this is an overt reference to the title of God himself in Daniel chapter seven. And Jesus not only claimed he was the pre-existent sovereign God of the universe, he made a prophecy that he would someday, and those guys were going to feel the wrath, he would vindicate his claim by judging the very court that was about to condemn him. By combining Daniel's words with David's words from Psalms 110.1, Jesus was saying, someday I will sit on the Father's throne at his right hand and I will share in his glory. Something that God said, I will not share with any man. I will share my glory with no one. Well, to those Old Testament scholars, this was the absolute height of blasphemy. Look at their response. The context tells you how they understood his words. Tearing his clothes, the high priest said, what further Do we need of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. How does it seem to you? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death and they spit at him and they blindfolded him and beat him with their fists and they said to him, prophesy. And the officers received him with slaps in the face. In addition to his titles, Jesus made some other outlandish claims. He claimed to personally possess all the unique attributes of God. He claimed to be able to do things that only God could do. In Matthew 26, 34, he claimed divine omniscience. He told Peter, hey, before the cock crows, the rooster crows three times, you're gonna disown me. In John 11, 43, he claimed and he asserted he, he had divine omnipotence by raising Lazarus from the dead and making a prophecy about his own resurrection, that he had power over life and death. Matthew 28, uh, 20 is the Great Commission, and you've heard this, this verse many, many times, but you probably never thought about this. But in that claim, in that commission to his disciples, Jesus made a claim to, to have a quality that only God has, the quality of omnipresence. He told his disciples, I want you to go and make disciples in all the world, right? And he said, as you go and do that, I will be with which one? Which, which disciple was Jesus going to be with? As you scatter across the face of the earth. I will be with you, it's plural. I'll be with all of you, always, even to the end of the earth. What kind of man says stuff like that? I'll be with every one of you wherever you go from now on. Wherever you go. In Luke chapter five, verse 20, he claimed the divine authority to forgive sin. Verse 21, the scribes and the Pharisees begin to reason, saying, who is this man who speaks blasphemies, who can forgive sins but God alone? And the Bible says Jesus, aware of their reasoning, because he's omniscient, he answered and said to them, why are you reasoning in your heart? Which is easier to say, your sins have been forgiven, or get up and walk? but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your stretcher, and go home. And immediately he got up before him, and he picked up what he'd been lying on, and he went home glorifying God, and they were struck with astonishment, and they began glorifying God, and they were filled with fear, saying, this is like the big understatement, we've seen remarkable things today. Consider this implicit claim of his deity. In John 20, 28, doubting Thomas finally saw Jesus. He hadn't been with him a couple of times. And he fell at his feet and he began to worship Jesus. Remember what he said? He said, my my Lord and my God. Listen, there's some other times in the Bible where people worshiped people that were representing God. They tried to worship angels. There's a couple of times they tried to worship the apostles. And both the angels and the apostles said, no, stop that, stop that, don't do that. Worship God, God alone, not Jesus. He received it. It was right. In his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus shocked the people with his teaching. The content was impressive, but what shocked them was the authority with which he spoke. He didn't say like all the other rabbis that that they had heard, the word of God says, the word of God says, and rabbi so-and-so says that this means this, and not like your preacher, right? This is what the word of God says, this is what this theologian says. I kind of think this, but I'm not real sure, but I'm kind of leaning this way, that's me. 
Jesus said, no, Moses said this, the Bible says this, God said this, but I say to you, and he put his pronouncements right equal with all of those things. What would you think about a preacher today who told his people, I am the bread of life. I am the living water. I am the light of the world. I am the true shepherd. I am the the one true vine. You think about that claim. He is claiming that all spiritual life is in, through, and sustained by a relationship with him. I mean, we've had a few guys pop in. I watched this special on David Koresh, you know, the other day. He said stuff like that. Jim Jones said stuff like that. What would you think about a preacher that said, I am the way. I am truth. I am life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Friends, if you ever hear a man say those things, you should run as fast and as far as you can, right? Unless he can actually validate all those claims with demonstration of divine power. And that leads us to reason number three that I believe Jesus validated his claims by amazing teaching and miracles, the chief of which being his own resurrection from the dead. The testimony is, the gospel writers, the the, the witness that we have is that Jesus taught like no man has ever taught before. Amazing teaching. The testimony that we have, the gospel writers claimed he he did wild stuff like he walked on water that he calmed the wind and the seas with the word. The gospel claim is that he knew what people were thinking and going to do before they did it. And the, the witness is that he healed the sick, he gave sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf, cast out demons, and raised the dead. Can I prove those things? I can't prove those. Can anyone disprove them? Let me tell you this, to say, as so many people say today, well, we know that Jesus did not do miracles because miracles do not exist. Well, that's not proof. You try making an argument like that with somebody who says that. They'll nail you to the wall. That's a ridiculous argument. Something's not true because I personally have never seen it or don't know about it. It's not possible for there to be anything in the universe that I don't understand. Really? Is that your argument? It's not, even, it's not even logical. Here's what logic says. If all of the testimony that we have, if all the evidence we have says the exact same thing, certainly the burden is now on the skeptic to prove the inaccuracy of the testimony or to try to prove a lack of integrity on the part of the witnesses. And that's how you would debunk the teachings of Christ. And trust me, for centuries, many have tried to do both of those. For every miracle in the Bible, Skeptics have proposed dozens of alternative explanations. They say Jesus walked on the water. Maybe the disciples were out in the wind and the wave and he was actually walking along the beach and they just thought he was on the water. Maybe there were some rocks out there that, that, that no, one, no one knew about. There's all these explanations. Take just for example the resurrection which is the miracle of miracles. There is the swoon theory which says that Jesus just fainted, that he didn't really die and then later he was revived in the tomb and so he walked out and, and he appeared for a while, but eventually the wounds that he got in the cross killed him, and, and so that's why he disappeared. That's one theory. Uh, the problem is it, it doesn't line up with the actual evidence and testimony that we have. Like when that Roman soldier stuck that spear up and blood, and there's an interesting detail, and water came gushing forth. They had burst the sack around his heart. He was dead. And, and it's interesting that the doctor, Dr. Luke, the physician, His account throws this little detail in that the others don't, but it proves that the swoon theory is not true, right? Not to mention how to get past the Roman soldiers and the rocks, right, the the sealed tomb. That's all there. There's There's this disciple stole the body theory. That was put out in the first century. That's in the Bible. There's an imposter theory that the, the Romans arrested the wrong guy and they killed him and, and then Jesus come up and act like he was resurrected from the dead. My problem with that is if I was the wrong guy that got arrested, I think somewhere along the way I'd be saying, hey, I'm not him. I'm not him, right? Somewhere, right? But, but the thing is, none of those things line up with the testimony that we have. And if you're gonna propose an alternative, it's gotta, it's gotta, it's gotta line up with all the testimony, all the evidence, There's no evidence at all to support any of the alternative theories. Every witness 
from Jesus' day whose testimony has survived to us, they all said the same thing about these stories. So all the alternative explanations are unsupported conjecture, and they are all based on the presupposition that anything that smacks miraculous we know cannot be true, so you have to choose something else. Well, if you start there, if that's your premise, then you're forced to one of two conclusions. You must believe that all of the gospel writers were either con men who were advancing some secret agenda, that's one option, or the other option, they were just poor, ignorant, naive idiots that were suffering mass hallucinations because Jesus was like some master hypnotist, right? Those are your two options if that's, if that's your view. I, I honestly cannot prove that the disciples were not part of a mass hallucination. I can't prove that. I would say, given the number of them, and given the fact that this, this thing happened on many separate incidents over many, many days, not just one time in one event where he could control all the factors, that theory to me seems to break down, and uh, I, I think it's less plausible than maybe something happened that I d don't understand, right? Uh, I can blow the other argument out of the water. The, I can make a strong case the gospel writers were not con men running a scam. That's just ridiculous. What did they gain? What was their agenda? What were they trying to accomplish? The bottom line is, because they all stuck to their story, every one of them lost everything they had in this world, including their families. They lost everything. All they had to do to save their lives was to renounce their testimony and they would have been spared. But to a man, they refused to do so. Beloved people do not give up everything that's dear to them in life and they do not willingly choose horrible, agonizing, torturous deaths for themselves and for their children to propagate a lie. What is absolutely clear is that the disciples believe their own stories. That's clear. Well, I don't have time today to cover number four, which is the fact that Jesus fulfilled almost 500 specific prophecies, some of which were made some 2,000 years before his birth, but that adds weight to why I believe. And, and I, don't, I, I don't have time, but, but we're gonna come back next week, and I've never done this before. We're gonna devote all of next week to point number five, and the fact that Jesus has had an unprecedented impact on human history. There's been no one else like him in, in the impact of his life ever, anywhere, no one even close. And we're gonna talk about that next week. And, and uh, you know, that doesn't prove anything, but it, it, it sure should draw your attention to this other stuff. But all this evidence, it leads us to a series of concluding choices, which is classically called the tri-dilemma and C.S. Lewis famously laid it out for us. Logic dictates that the claims of Christ about himself that we've talked about today, they're either true or they're false, right? Jesus made these statements, they're true or they're false. If you choose to believe that the claims of Christ are false, then you have two choices to kind of explain it. Either he knew his claims were false or he believed his claims were true but said them. If you choose to believe Jesus knowingly made false statements, false claims, then you have decided that Jesus is a liar, but not a little liar, the biggest liar of all history. I mean, a genius liar, a scam artist who with mass deception and hypnosis or something fool, fooled thousands of people, caused them to die for him, for his lie. Number two, if you choose to believe that Jesus believed what he said, then you've deduced that Jesus was a lunatic. And not a little lunatic, but a raving, loony lunatic with grand self-delusions. He believed things that we lock up people today when they believe those things. You know, there's an irony that very few people in our world want to say Jesus was a liar or Jesus was a raving maniac, a lunatic. They don't want to say that. But friends, his claims, they leave you no other choices. What you cannot say with any integrity at all is that Jesus was a really good man. You can't say that because of his claims. You can't say he was just another great teacher or great religious leader 
because he made claims that Buddha didn't make and Confucius didn't make and Muhammad didn't make. He, he, this is, this, he's different than all the others because of these crazy claims. And you can't say he was a good man or a good teacher or a great leader. You have to deal with what he said about himself and what he apparently tried to prove about himself. Now, if you go back up to the first fork in the road and you choose to believe that the claims of Christ are true, then you must confess that Jesus is Lord. But you still have a choice to make. He is who he is, whether you believe it or not, but you must choose who he will be in your life. And so will you reject him as Lord of your life or will you confess him as the Lord of your life? Friends, logic will only take us so far. In the end, choosing to believe in Jesus is not an issue of emotion, though I think we all ought to be very emotional about Jesus. And it's not an issue of intellect, though I think knowledge and understanding, and they're great guardrails for us. They shape us. They point us in the right direction. But at the core, knowledge is not the issue of faith. It's not about knowing more stuff. Faith is very simple. It centers in the will of man. Faith is about surrendering one's will to his lordship. It's about trusting and obeying Jesus. And for you to know him as Lord and Savior somewhere along the way, you're gonna have to make the choice to go beyond what you know and to go beyond what you might feel and believe in him. Here's the sixth reason that I believe It's my own testimony and the testimony of many others in this room, in whatever room you're sitting at, there's people sitting around you today that can give a testimony. The testimony of people all around the world, which I've heard. The testimony of people throughout history, which I've read. Friends, here's my story. When I let go of my demand to understand and control everything, which is kind of my thing, When I let go of that and I surrendered to Christ, something happened. Jesus, by his grace, did a work in my life and through faith he gave me the gift of his Holy Spirit and and I had an experience of his presence. Now I'll tell you, that was really, really strong and then sometimes I don't feel it as much and then there's been other times it's been stronger than it was and then sometimes it's not as strong But even in the last few months, as my families went through some really, really hard things, we've had this experience. Jesus is very real, and he's very present to me, and that's my testimony. Maybe my witness, maybe if you knew my life better, if you knew knew the radical changes for good, if you knew what a jerk I would be if Jesus wasn't in my life, if you knew how he's impacted my life, my family, my, my finances, my work ethic, everything about me is different. Maybe it would encourage your faith. And maybe if you share your stories with one another, it will encourage your faith. Well, we're gonna see more reasons next week, but all of these reasons, they only bring us to a place where we have to make this choice. And and this choice, it's, it's not a blind leap of faith, not a blind leap into the dark as some have described it. Friends, it's just a little step into the arms of a loving master. And I pray if you haven't made that choice, you would go beyond your feelings, you'd go beyond your knowledge, and you would say, Jesus, I I give you my life, I surrender my will, I trust you. Father, we thank you for our time together today. We thank you, Lord, for our time in your word. I I pray, Father, that that you would uh, give us a clarity about what happened and what didn't happen and what's true and what's false and Father, I pray that you would equip us to give an account, to give, to give the logic of why we hope. Lord, I pray you'd also help us to remember and help us to know that in the end it's about faith. It's about letting you be who you are in our life. And I pray, Father, that you, you would help us to do that today. In Jesus' name, amen.